Good morning. It is 4.08 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm trying to knock this out early today. Because I have a big day. It is, let's see, September the 28th. 2021 years from something. Uh, this... <laughs> Geez, I wish this graphic would get off the screen. Boom, there it goes. I do have to change this wallpaper. It's been up for a long time. It's, you know, it's like cracked, stained concrete. It's not very inviting. You know, concrete's kind of cold and hard. You know, maybe I need to change that to some nice wood. Nice, rich, stained wood. Something like that. But anyways, this is episode number gajillion of Let's Consider Luke. It's not really episode gajillion. It's episode nine. Nine is an interesting number, isn't it? Now, there's some folks out there who talk a lot about numerology and the symbols of numbers used in things, you know, like occulted uh, symbology of numbers. I don't know too much about that. Now, I do know that certain numbers are used a lot. Numbers that are multiples of six, um, those are used a lot. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of threes and thirty threes and three hundreds and nines and ninety nines and nine hundreds and eighty eights and oh boy, there are. Um, the only thing is, I will say, because I don't know enough about this stuff, and there's just not much for, you know, reliable information that could show me solid patterns and that I would have something really good to go on. I will say this. There are, there are only 10 base numbers from, from 0 to 9 in our numerical system that they call, <laughs> they call Arabic. Oh, Jeez, yeah, they came up with it. So, what I don't you see the the problem I see is um, if you've got ten, and uh, and the numbers that we think the you know the, the people are occulting are uh, more than a third of that. The problem is they're gonna just pop up e everywhere. And if we think that there are special number combinations that they use. That may be so if patterns can be seen in those numbers. And, and maybe if you found a lot of those numbers in patterns in certain ways, you could start making a case for them being, you know, used as, you know, occulting uh, certain messages. For sure. I'm on board with that, for sure. I just haven't seen it. I haven't seen anybody make a good case out of that. I sure would like to because I don't know enough about numbers and well, there's not a lot of them and if we start speculating too much on numbers hmm I don't know seems a little bit like a slippery slope maybe we could get kinda lost in that you know uh, but we're gonna pick up at uh, doo -doo, Luke sitting well of course Luke what did you think we were going to do? Luke 16, 18. Now, I, I think I may have just kind of gave that a wink and a nod last time, but it's important. It's important, and it's an issue I haven't talked at length about, and there's a reason for that. When I came to understand this issue, it was it was a long time ago, actually, and I haven't talked about it hardly at all. I mean, if I, I might have mentioned something about it in passing in my videos, that would be a big deal. There's, there's a reason for it. And um, the reason is, like half the population out there, no matter who you are, are probably not going to care for it. Understandably so, and... <sighs> It does have a lot to do with what our condition is, which is why, you know, it's, it's a topic that 
I can tell you, women don't like it. Now, part of the reason, you have to understand this, too. And maybe I should just reinforce um, this truth. There's a, a real truth here that I want to at least explain about me before I talk about this, so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, I'm not a misogynist, all right? And uh, one thing I do not enjoy whatsoever is, is even denigrating women. I hate that. I really hate that. Now, I may uh, criticize the way that women act today and maybe most specifically criticize the way that Israelite women act. I criticize the way Israelite men act. My, my chief desire is for us to go back to keeping the law as was given to our fathers in an agreement back at Mount Horeb or, or Mount Sinai, Sini, because there are very concrete, very definite blessings and cursings, as outlined in Deuteronomy 28, that comes along with that. that that's my, my chief desire. Um, there's really no one that I, I, I take any pleasure in, in denigrating. Now, I don't care if we're talking about um, the fairer sex. I don't care if we're talking about other races or who we're talking about, I don't enjoy denigrating anyone. This is not about denigrating. And we may not be able to understand immediately what the purposes of this is, but I think based on the way our enemy acts and laws and social conditioning that they have successfully implemented and how that has adversely affected our our society, our country, our communities, our family, um, the dynamics of marriage, and etc. Et really plays into this and how important these points of law are. Okay, so go back to what I've said at least a few times in the preceding episodes. Um, Imagine that you are in a position where you don't have four Gospels to, to go through and to use as cross-references if you don't understand a certain thing, or if something is said in a certain way in one account. Just imagine you don't have any of the other accounts to, to, even, to even clarify what you're seeing. Okay, and... The, that's one of the things that I can't impress enough about how seriously we should take these contradictions that we find between mostly, yes, Luke and Matthew, but when I use Matthew, again, the reason is because um, Matthew is the one gospel that has the greatest amount of harmony with the Law and the Prophets. The reason that is so important I'll actually quote something here real quick, and I'm going to try to keep my place. All right, this is Deuteronomy 13.1. This is really important stuff, guys. Um, when we consider, uh, there's so many preachers out there, like evangelical Protestant preachers out there, that they've delivered so many messages. And I, I remember back in the early days when I was, I would have considered myself a, you know, like a Protestant evangelical and, uh, you know, would argue mostly from the New Testament, you know, and Greek and all this stuff. It was a very different mindset than when I started studying the Old Testament and the language of the Old Testament and all the foundations. Because without the Old Testament, you don't have a faith. If you call yourself a Christian or a Bible believer, did I say New Testament? Without the Old Testament, you don't have Christianity. You don't have a faith. The, here is the problem. Okay, um, Christianity without the Old Testament is what we experience in the world today. It comes to us by way of Catholicism, Protestantism, 
all kinds of isms that divorce themselves from the message which is the message of the Old Testament is the greatest bulk of information that we have on the God of Israel Israel God's people and the prophecies about the Messiah why the Messiah came what he was uh, coming to do and so on and so forth and so on and so forth the greatest bulk of all of that information that we have is in what we call the Old Testament no Old Testament no New Testament if you have no Old Testament all you have is New Testament and then somebody getting to come along and make up a lot of rules or dogmas or doctrines based mostly on that and whatever they want to I could say fantasize about what the New Testament says or implies but I don't think this is necessarily you know just um, whimsical fantasy but it has a lot to do with control control of our mind control of people control of Yahweh's Israel people by way of religion that's no good so you gotta understand the importance of the Old Testament which is which is absolutely totally completely without a doubt understated in all of our churches today it is understated in all of the messages that we hear from people who do messages on like the promises of God and they will pull extensively from the New Testament and when they pull from the Old Testament they don't tell you who he's talking to specifically and and what the qualifications of that people are because there's qualifications to that people it's not just those people who um, are drawn to him by faith though there is room for some of those people and we do see that we see that in the repentance of Nineveh Nineveh were not Israelites we see that in uh, the fact that he had a prophet before uh, Israel had even entered back into Canaan that we call Balaam he was not an Israelite he was not the seed of Abraham there there is room essentially for others but there is there is a set of laws to be uh, carried out by this people who are the genetic seed of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and there are there are provisions for inclusion of others within the law there there is an order to all of this there are answers to all of these questions whether they all seem uh, very clear at this point in time or not with all of the filters that the Bible has gone through the filters of the Masoretes which change so much about our understanding of the Bible uh, the, the filters of sectarians Anglicans um, that's a huge filter because you know we probably use the King James more than anything else m more than any other uh, translation most English translations are based on King James uh, this you know this this Anglican work or you have Dewey Reams uh, based on the Septuagint uh, I would posit that the Septuagint was actually based on a at least one Masoretic not pure Obery manuscript and there's a lot of reasons for that what you have to understand is we've really got to get our understanding about the New Testament from the old you don't have a New Testament without the old you have no faith without the Old Testament we have to get our information and we have to get our promises because promises in the Old Testament are absolutely concrete they're really clear the the promises in the new it's harder to argue a lot of these things because of the oddities of specifics who was this person talking to who was that person talking to and so on and so forth and a lot of people have to spend a lot of time convincing us that for instance that certain congregations that Paul was writing to were Israelites because he names them different things and so a lot of people have to spend a lot of time just you know trying to prove that these are are Israelites he's talking to when if you go to the Old Testament you can see you know in abundant clarity Yahweh is talking to Israelites so not to minimize you know those things but I'm trying to give us some kind of a, a clarity here you know an anchor 
Now in Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1, Yahweh says this to the people, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and give thee a sign or a wonder, and, um, geez, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize I had my fan on. And now it doesn't even want to turn off. Hopefully that, that didn't cause too much background noise. I apologize for that. It's sometimes I, I'm, I'm not even aware of it. So, uh, again, here we go. And I don't think I can run a noise filter on this without taking the audio out, doing that, and then trying to remarry it to the video. Yeah. So anyways, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and give thee a sign or wonder, and the sign or wonder come to pass, wherefore he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us serve them. And you... Uh, you shall not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for Yahweh, your Aliyim God, proveth you, he's testing you, to know whether you love Yahweh, your Aliyim God, with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after Yahweh and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and cleave unto him. Now, I won't go through all those blessings and cursings in Deuteronomy 28. I have in other presentations, in fact, and I fully plan on continuing to do so because they're so utterly concrete. But this is so important. He said, if, if a prophet arose among you and they gave a prophecy or they did signs and miracles, and even if that prophecy of his came to pass, he says, but then he draws you after other gods, which part of drawing you after other gods would be convincing you to be lawless. Because if you're lawless, you are not serving Yahweh, the God of Israel. So this is very, very important. And this is what I would then test everything by is whether or not this person whether they be an author whether they were a historical character that came along it doesn't matter i test them all by the law and the prophets and i say the law and the prophets because the law and the prophets are made up of a great many books um, whether they are uh, per se precepts or whether they are historical accounts or um, uh, prophecies whatever they are, they all weave together in such a tight tapestry, reinforcing the idea of the law or the agreements made with the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, various different agreements and covenants. Some of those covenants are, in a sense, they're one-sided, no matter what this will happen, like the ones with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some of them are agreements as far as two-party actions, like the agreements made at Mount Horeb all having to do with the laws that were given there and then, and they all had to do with um, taking the land, owning the land, keeping the land, being blessed in the land, uh, being blessed in the seed of our body as far as our children, having many children, being blessed with health, being blessed with money. As far as when I say money, what I basically mean is uh, great possessions, cattle, flocks, herds, uh, good crops coming in, all of that, that, these are part of keeping the law. So if we see things that, if we see things from authors that even denigrate prosperity or richness, uh, we have to be concerned about that. Because Yahweh says that if we keep the law and if we abide in his word, we will be blessed. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't go through hard times. It doesn't mean that we might not uh, endure hardships, temptations, and testing, just like Job did, just like many righteous people have done. That's true. But in general, we should, we should not look at wealth, somebody having a great deal of wealth, as, as if there's anything wrong with that. What we need to look at is, are they a lawful man? Do they serve? Do they serve Yahweh? Are they? Do they keep his, his statutes, his commandments? What kind of a person are they? That's what we should look at, as opposed to just that they may have a lot. 
Now, that wasn't necessarily a rabbit trail because I wanted to talk about how important it is the precepts of the law and the blessings or cursings for that. Because then in, in Luke chapter 16, verse 18, I don't know why that nestled between this very lengthy and very confusing parable of the dishonest manager and this very lengthy confusing and and very very frequently used story or parable of the rich man and Lazarus we find a single verse with a single precept that not only does not match what the precept the same one that we would find in Matthew it doesn't match what the law has to say about this topic in Luke 16, 18, Luke purports that at this point Jesus said, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whosoever marries her that is put away from her husband commits adultery. Now the first thing I want to do is show this to you in contrast just with what we would typically say were complementary verses in Matthew to show you how they are in fact not complementary they are contradictory and then I want to talk to you a little bit about the law and what the law has to say about marriage and putting away and so forth so that I can illustrate to you how damaging this gospel would be to somebody reading it without the advantage of having multiple Gospels to compare it to, um, or what if they didn't have the Law and the Prophets to compare it to either, and they were just reading it by itself. I mean, besides the fact that we, we will see a contradiction here, and that's bad enough. But if this contradiction existed and was being fed into the mind of others, without this overwhelming weight of the rest of Scripture along with it, that would be, it would shape someone's behavior in a very profound way. And therein lies the danger. So let's see what it says in Matthew 5.32. This is supposedly a parallel passage. Matthew 5.32, But I say unto you, that whosoever put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever shall marry her, that is divorced, commits adultery. So in Matthew 5.32, what he says is that if you put away your wife, not if you put away your wife, if you put away your wife for any reason other than immorality. And we'll see this idea, we can see it a lot in the Old Testament, the idea of putting away a wife for the cause of immorality. Now, that doesn't, immorality is not simply um, just having sex with someone else. Having sex with someone else, if your wife had sex with someone else, that is adultery and that carries along with it the penalty of death. You do not, you do not even think about fooling around with another man's wife. You don't even think about it. That is the cause for why David was not allowed to build the Beit Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, because he committed adultery. He committed adultery and then had a man killed over it. This is talking about immorality. What is immorality? Well, that's a good question. You see, have you ever heard a lot of people, let's say, um, MGTOW is becoming more and more pronounced these days. Men going their own way, MGTOW. One of the things that they'll talk about is how 
women are in a position today where they can use the desire that men naturally have for them because that's a natural thing built in there's a man's desire for a, a woman specifically one that's attractive or makes herself attractive there's a lot of ways a, a woman can be attractive it's that's not entirely physical you know like what you see when you look at them but they oftentimes use this lots of women do as not just a weapon but a means to control um to, a means to get what they want and they will often use sex or the withholding of sex to manipulate don't anybody tell me that that's not true you can come on here and you can say well i don't do that okay well maybe that may be so i don't know but don't tell me that isn't the case that is immoral withholding sex from your husband to get what you want or because you're upset with him because he made a decision you didn't like or he had to tell you the way things were in the house and that he is the leader he makes the final decisions and we are not going to do that thing that you want and so what do you do you withhold affection and sex from him this can become a pattern it often does become a pattern in a marriage that is immoral adultery adultery is different adultery came with the sentence of death death this is the law if you folks don't want to hear the law you've come to the wrong place I'm telling you what the law says and now, okay, considering various language and how various terms and languages has changed, it is a good point to say, well, is there, is there anything about all of these passages, and there's so many passages, having to do with what adultery is or what immorality is in the Old Testament? There is such a great weight to them and a consistency in the wording used in most of them to suggest and then if we just look at the way that men are the way that women are how we are built what is the natural order of things it makes a whole lot of sense so don't get mad at me for telling you the law this is the law the law has concrete promises of either blessings for keeping it or cursings for not keeping it I'll continue So not only does Matthew say something different, Matthew says, unless it's the cause of immorality, you could put her away for immorality. You had every right under the law to do that. Could you forgive her? As her husband, you could. You could. And I'm sure there were, there were many circumstances in which a husband did, depending depending on what because we're talking about immorality we're not talking about adultery you know and i'm sure that as we degraded as a as a people and and in our worst points in time there was probably a lot more adultery that was forgiven or even encouraged so in matthew 19 9 it says i say unto you whosoever shall put away his wife except for fornication and shall marry another commits adultery and whosoever marries her which is put away doth commit adultery mm -hmm. oh and what he's saying there by the way he's not saying the man has committed adultery again he's saying the same thing he said in Matthew 532 it's just translated more clearly in Matthew 532 He's saying if you put her away for any other reason, you make her an adulterer. Well, how do you make her an adulterer and not him an adulterer? I'll explain. There's a difference. And this is why a lot of women will freak out. Because this is what the law says. 
I'll reference adultery. Now, there are various words that are used for either adultery, um, immorality, and so on and so forth. There's a few of them, okay? But we can look at a consistency of word used over a number of passages found in the law. So we'll look at a few passages using the word nap, N-A-P, nap, for adultery, okay? Exodus 20:14, you shall not commit adultery. It's a very simple short verse. Exodus 20:10, and the man that commits adultery with another man's wife. Understand that adultery is not cheating as as we've been conditioned to believe it is because our first response in every church out there pretty much will teach this unless they're Mormons and then of course the Mormons hold certain views that are and so what they do is they use the principle that <laughs> okay the early Mormons they did they did not support biblical doctrines the early Mormons were extraordinarily immoral they they supported wife swapping and whatnot which is despicable that's not what we're talking about so, of course, this idea gets a very bad rap because of guilt by association. But what we'll think of today, when we think of adultery or we think of cheating, we think that it is something that either spouse, male or female, does if, if they have anything to do with somebody else that is cheating, that is adultery. That's what churches teach, but it's not in the law. It's not in the law. Now, the reason I, I sat on this for a long time is because I understood this a long time ago. A long time ago. I understood its implications a long time ago. And I knew that because of how flipped upside down our society, our culture, our family, and the roles of men and women have been that it's going to be very difficult. It's going to be difficult for, I think, for both parties. Probably to understand the dynamics and implications of this. Because this isn't all about the, the man um, getting to live out a fantasy or something. We've got to see beyond that. And any man who would use this for that purpose is completely missing the point of the law. He's entirely missing the point of the law. So, this is something that can only be committed by a woman against her husband. This is not committed by a husband, and I will show you why that is. This can be committed by a woman against her husband, or it can be committed by a man f by messing around with the wife of another man. That's how this act is committed. Now I'm going to sh I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a picture of how this works. Now, throughout the Old Testament, both Israel and Judah are accused of committing adultery for whoring after other gods. Because Israel and Judah were the woman in the relationship. Yahweh, the man, he's the husband. He could, if he chose, he could have any other people. He could bless anyone he wanted to. He could save an entire city of Assyrians and whatnot, whoever all lived there, might have been more than just Assyrians that lived there. He could save that whole city of non-Israelites if he chose, and he did. It's his prerogative. He can do that. Israel and Judah cannot serve any god they want. Why? Because Yahweh is the sovereign. And that's the way it works. It's not a two-way relationship. In the fact that it's not 
the same dynamically. Both parties do not have the same power. Both parties do not have the same responsibility. It is not Israel or Judah's responsibility to sustain Yahweh. It's his responsibility to sustain an obedient Israel and Judah. You see how there's a difference. And there is a difference in the roles, requirements, dynamics, and points of law as they pertain to either the husband or the wife. Now we see the same commandment repeated again in Deuteronomy 5.18, you shall not commit adultery, nup. Um, and then we see a lot of passages concerning the adulterer and adultery after that. Now, in addition to simply the word nap, which is translated sometimes adultery, there are also a number of other words that are translated as immorality, uh, a whoring, harlotry, and things like that. And they all contribute to our understanding of what the laws are of a husband and of a wife and how they reflect the laws of Yahweh and his people Israel and Judah. We can see this, for instance, all through the, um, there are a few chapters in the books of the law that have to do with immorality, sexual immorality. And you can see, if you read them carefully, that they have much to do with a different dynamic being stated concerning the man and his responsibilities and things of that nature, and the woman. They are different. There is not an equality of who gets what and who can do what in Yahweh's law. We have to come to terms with that. That's a fact. Also, in Yahweh's law, there are provisions concerning a man and his wives. Wives with a V-E-S, wives, if he does choose to take more than one wife. Or concubine, and now this is this is another woman who I you know I'm not entirely sure what her role is other than wife because here's the thing wife is just Asha. When you see Asha, that's what's translated as wife. So oftentimes men had multiple women that were bearing his children. Our own patriarch, for anybody who uh, loves and adores the Bible, you must understand. Our own patriarch, Jacob, had two wives and two concubines, from which the twelve tribes proceeded. Understand that. The prophet Samuel was the only son of his mother, who was the second wife of Manoah. This happens quite frequently. David had many wives. The only unrighteousness he was accused of was in the matter of Uriah and Bathsheba. Solomon had many wives and many concubines. He had way more than is even reasonable because he indulged himself. He indulged himself. The criticism of Solomon was actually not how many wives and concubines he had. The criticism of Solomon was that he took so many wives and concubines of other people, not his people, Israel. There are provisions in the law concerning multiple wives and what you are to do if you have multiple wives, how you are to treat them. And you know what? I'll give you a few real quick uh, for those who don't believe what I'm saying, maybe. I'm doing this stop and start so I can get to the, the key passages in a timely manner. But we do have Numbers 5.12. Now, the, the chapter of Numbers 5 has to do with if a man suspects his wife is cheating on him and obviously keeping it secret from him because of the implications of it. There are no passages I want to bring this to your attention. All of the passages concerning the dynamics of men and women and how men are to behave and the taking of wives and the, the laws of, of marriage and men and women, they all are speaking to men and what he may do and so on and so forth. 
they are not speaking to women other than like they never say if a woman takes a husband this and that and the other then she's to obey him and be faithful to him period a man has different laws than a woman if women are freaking out right now hearing this I'm sorry I don't know what to tell you there are different laws for different people there are different laws for people who are not Israelites they are not immoral but they are different that's just a fact this all has to do with what a woman's responsibility is as a wife and they are absolutely in no way the same as men's responsibilities as husband his responsibility as husband is far different than a woman's responsibility as a wife they're not the same they are not equal and I hope that this will give you some kind of an idea of how much social engineering has gone on and we can all see it in order to elevate the power of women so that the natural development of a nation and people is not seen in us all of these laws that they implement have to do with us and restricting the amount of children that we have and how much we are able to grow not all people specifically Israel now I will tell you this in Deuteronomy 17 17 it is speaking to a king because Yahweh knew that eventually we would want a king we'd say we want a king and he was giving all the specific uh, he gave this all through the prophets before there was a Solomon by the way he knew how the kings would behave because he knew they would have the power to do certain things and he knew that a lot of women would be glad to be the wife one of the wives of a king because these kings had so much power these were not kings over a little dust kingdom in Palestine this was a great mighty kingdom and he was giving provisions for a king and in in these provisions he says starting in Deuteronomy 17:15 thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee whom Yahweh thy God shall choose one from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee that's why all of these presidents if i can't prove that they are an israelite they're not my king they're not my president i'm sorry uh, this is the law okay thou mayest not set a stranger over thee you may not set a stranger over thee okay Kamala Harris is a stranger and is a woman she's not allowed to be in that role anyways sorry but a stranger there's this Ethiopian woman who's like a, a, a representative up in Minnesota what is she doing representing the people in Minnesota she doesn't represent at least a large part of what's supposed to be her constituency why because we're not supposed to set a stranger over us you do not set a stranger over thee which is not your brother you see but he shall not multiply horses to himself nor cause the people to return to Mitzrim to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as Yahweh has set unto you you shall henceforth return no more that way because we all know we all know what a breeding haven for fine horses that Egypt is <laughs> uh, okay now he goes on in Deuteronomy 17 17 neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold he never says that he can't have riches he's not to store up masses of riches unto himself he's not to store up masses of wives and concubines for his own pleasure why well for one thing those wives and those concubines could have been more well distributed amongst the men of the land and have them children how many children do you suppose Solomon must have had 
with about 700 wives and 300 concubines. Do you think he fit them all into those eight acres to the southeast of what they call Jerusalem that they say is the city of David? Do you think? Do you think he could have fit them all in the opulence he gave to them in Jerusalem? Oh yeah, I know. He built houses for various ones, the, the ones that were he thought were really important in various cities. But my goodness, just think about it for a minute. I know I'm rabbit trailing. But this doesn't have anything to do with whether he has multiple wives. It is the multiplication of, there are words used like mud, which indicates a great multiplication. It's not plural. Plural is not the problem. The great multiplication is, and I'll illustrate that to you. Deuteronomy 21, starting in verse 15. If a man have two wives, one beloved and another hated, and they have borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. If the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he makes his sons to inherit that which he has, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. It has, it's saying nothing about if a man has two wives, that's a problem. It says nothing about if a man has three wives, that's a problem. David had three wives when he was running from Saul before he was even king. That was not a problem. That was not the problem. The mismanagement of his household and his lack of attention to his children was the problem. And now a lot of people may take issue with this, but don't take issue with me. Take issue with the law. If you want to take issue, take issue with the law. This is the law. Now, why does the law exist? Why is it absolutely acceptable under the law for a man to have multiple wives or wife and concubine or combination of? Well, there's a few reasons that we could consider. One of them would be, first off, a righteous nation or a righteous man who has been blessed would have the ability to have more children. You see, when a man takes, and this is part of the reason why our, our economy is as, it is as it is, why our enemies have pushed for uh, types of legislation that not only elevate a woman, uh, but put her in uh, equal place economically with men. This doesn't have anything to do with them loving women and being concerned about women's rights. They hate women. They put women in pornography and they do all kinds of horrible, uh, abusive, despicable thing to women, things to women. Uh, women in the workplace are, are absolutely denigrated. Absolutely den denigrated in the workplace. They are not empowered. Anytime a woman gets empowerment in the workplace, you know, in, in what is a man's world, they will do it by way of being denigrated in some way or another. That's a fact. So there's nothing uh, loving towards women um, in the uh, supposed elevation of them in our modern society in America or in Israelite countries, period. When I say Israelite countries, I certainly don't mean the Israelites are running them. But where most of us exist is what I mean. This curtails the amount of multiplication of Israelites, for one thing. It also makes life very difficult for the family because the men has less authority, less control. 
in Yahweh's law. The man does not answer to his woman. The man answers to Yahweh. The woman answers to the man. The children answer to the woman or the man. That's the way it works. Um, I mean, I am truly sorry if this hits some people like a ton of bricks, but it is the law. Now, love Paul or hate Paul, be very confident in him or suspicious of him. One thing that's interesting about him is in his pastoral epistles, when he's specifying what the, and you have to keep something in mind, the entire structure of the church as we know it is Pauline. Doesn't come from Jesus, it's Pauline. Now he's specifying what, what should be the, uh, the characteristics of a guy who is a, a shepherd, overseer, you know, poimon, whatever. And he says he should be the husband of one wife. Now that's Paul, and that's Paul's opinion. But what's interesting about it is he, he makes no judgment about anyone having multiple wives. He's just saying he thinks that if someone is an overseer, they should have one wife. I'm pointing that out to illustrate to you that there is not one shred of immorality to a man having multiple wives. There's something wrong with the immorality of casual sex. You see, and there are provisions for this. Keep this in mind. No matter who you are listening to this, there are provisions. Okay, a man cannot just go out and have sex with whoever he feels like. This is not about fulfilling a man's sexual fantasies. And I suppose the any of the men who would take this reality, these points of law, and use them just specifically for that is, is really missing the point, A, and B, he probably needs to take some time and ask himself if his mind has been sexually perverted in some way, if that's possible. Because look, at the same time that women have been empowered over men, which hurts the family, it hurts our Israelite communities and society, at the same time, um, the man has, he has been traumatized by this in his own way, and he has been distorted. His perception of sex has been distorted and perverted. And now, not that there's anything wrong with seeking to get pleasure in sex. There's a reason that there's pleasure involved in sex, because if there wasn't any pleasure involved in sex, it would be very difficult to get us to do it. But we have to think about what would be the motivations. You see, when it comes to like the early Mormons, and you look at their behavior, somebody in that group, somebody in that group knew enough Bible where they could show anyone that a man having multiple wives was absolutely moral. But they didn't do that. That was not the point and purpose of what they were doing. These people were just degenerates. They were degenerates. They were wife-swapping degenerates. And that's what they did. It, it wasn't that they had multiple wives and they had multiple children because of multiple wives. And they did. A number of them did have multiple wives and, and father multiple children by multiple wives. That's true. But that wasn't kind of the point. If you look into the stories and accounts from the these early Mormons, that wasn't the, the case. More often than not, they were participating in wife swapping, um, orgies, very, very strange, bizarre uh, practices. On top of their militant raiding and, and murdering 
stealing from people um and their uh, their campaigns their abolitionist campaigns yeah a lot of the abolitionists in the 17 1800s they weren't again think about this for a second the abolitionist movement and what it caused all the problems that it caused consider that and consider who was doing it and then it was very much like let's say the women's lib movement of today or the civil rights movement of today Th these were not things being perpetrated whether or not good things came from them and we could argue over that they were not being perpetrated by people who gave uh, who gave a crap about the, the, the purported people that they wanted seen treated so well. We can see the hypocrisy in, you know, in women's lib today. We can see that hypocrisy in the civil rights movement of today. And I'm absolutely convinced that that same hypocrisy existed back then with the abolitionist movement. Now, I bring that up because that the Mormons were often also involved in abolitionism and it was political it was military what they did that's what they were and they pretty much still are today the alphabet agencies they recruit heavily from mormons um how much of of mormons are actually a people that are not israel another tribe very 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 likely That's another reason why guys like Mormon, Devin Stack, who he, sa he says he's not a Mormon anymore, but he is a Mormon. He comes from Mormons. He'll tell you he's one of the descendants of Brigham Young. They try to convince you of this thing like that whites are all the same. You're white. No, it's not that you're German, it's not that you're Anglo, it's not that you're Celt, you're white. That's just not reality, as we see it in the Bible. All the patriarchs were huh, white, as Jared Taylor, Jared Taylor would tell you. Why, why do I keep repeating Taylor? Well, because one of the main founders of LDS in Mormonism was the Taylor family. One of their early powerful presidents was a Taylor. When this guy, there was a couple of guys a while ago who just got scrubbed from YouTube, by the way. They got scrubbed from YouTube. They were looking into the background and affiliations of John Minadeo, who goes by the name Handsome Truth. They found that he comes from, in part, Mormon founding fathers, tailors. It's all really important. And the problem is that as we look at it, polygamy, a lot of people, they look at, for instance, Mormons, and, of course, polygamy has been painted as this awful, abusive, you know, it's, it's all just based on a man getting off, so on and so forth. It's been painted in the ugliest way for a reason. Because just like abortion and many other uh, immoral laws that they've imposed upon us, it restricts our ability to multiply. Get it? How is that? Well, just look at nature. I can have, and look, don't get hung up on the, uh, the metaphor, okay? It's a metaphor, but it illustrates something that is a reality, okay? I can have one bull and 20 cows and I can use that bull to inseminate 20 cows because of the biology 
of the male and the biology of the female. The female carries the child. And so it takes about 10 months for that female to carry that child to maturity. And then the female nurtures the child. And it takes a certain amount of time for the female to properly nurture the child before they're a toddler. The man doesn't. The man gives his seed. So if a man was giving his seed to multiple women, I'm not saying 20, but if he's giving his seed to multiple women, just like in the case of our father Jacob, he can multiply his descendants very quickly. And when you look at how quickly the children of the 12 patriarchs multiplied in Mitzram when they went down there, it's entirely reasonable and fair to think that many of them had multiple wives or wives and concubines, as Jacob did. Now, I've said multiple times in this video that I'm sorry for this reality. And the only thing I'm sorry about is the fact that we've been so far removed from the fact that this is reality. This is an integral part of the law. Men's roles, women's roles, what constitutes cheating, because I hear that all the time. He cheated. He cheated. Well, a lot of these men that I hear mean he cheated. I, I almost block that out anymore. Why? Well, like I said earlier, first off, there's just way too many women out there that are far too empowered. And that's part of what this goes back to. Far too many women, when they are given this certain amount of power where they can use sex to get their way, that is dangerous. It's very dangerous because they manipulate with it. Oh, I know. You're the, you're the one woman who doesn't manipulate using sex. I know your mom probably never manipulated anyone concerned, you know, using sex or anything. I know. But that's a problem because that is a very normal thing when a woman is given that much power. She does that. Just like men have their own set of issues if they're given certain things that they're not supposed to have if ignorant people who don't read don't study don't have any idea what in the world is going on are given the right to vote <laughs> and it's dangerous i'm not picking on women here i'm telling you what this is the law this is the law. And we just saw in Deuteronomy 13, if anybody comes with signs or wonders or anything else, and they should teach contrary to the law, you will put them away from you. In some instances, we are told to kill false prophets who would lead us away from obeying Yahweh. And here we have it. Luke 16:18 says, Whosoever putteth away his wife and marries another commits adultery. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. Regarding the law, that is not true. It is true that she would commit adultery. That would be the case. For a man to commit adultery, he would have to have sex with another man's wife. That's the law. It's defined in the law. We saw that. It's shown in the law. Now, the language may have been changed a little bit here, tweaked a little bit, to make it sound a certain way, just like we saw in Matthew 19.9. But the clarity to all of that is outside of the reason of immorality. And they translate it fornication, immorality. 
whosoever puts away his wife, other than for the case of immorality, and she marries another, she commits adultery, and the man who married her commits adultery. Do you get how that works? Because you put her away for some other reason than not being immoral. You had no cause. And now you've made her and the guy who marries her both adulterers. There's a difference. But the way that it's stated here in Luke, when it doesn't, for one thing, give us that qualification for immorality, other than for immorality, other than for immorality. That's, that's massive. Because if you're reading Luke and you don't have Matthew, or you don't have uh, the Old Testament, you don't have the Law and the Prophets to go by, you're going to get a completely different understanding of what the dynamics of marriage are and the point of law that might even be referenced here. And if we do have the Law and the Prophets, and we look at this statement, and then we go back to the Law and the Prophets like we just did, we're going to say to ourselves, wait a minute, are you trying to tell me Jesus really said that? Because that doesn't follow the law. And if he's saying things that are contrary to the law, we can go back to Deuteronomy 13 and see what should be done about men who are teaching contrary to the law. See, the Pharisees and religious leaders, they never had a problem with him because he went against the law. They had a problem with him because he went against them and their traditions. The power that they held over the people through their traditions, through their office. They would oftentimes twist his word and accuse him of breaking the law to give them some kind of right because he was very popular with the people, a lot of people. You know, a man who can bring people back to life and heal, completely heal terrible sicknesses, they're going to be very popular. The Pharisees needed a precept. And they knew that the people would, whether they were all that happy about it or not, would understand if the precept was he was teaching against the law or breaking the law. That's how important the law was. But then here in Luke, we're supposed to believe that he was teaching something that was actually not the law. Because it is not the law that if you put away your wife and you marry another, if you want to take it for, for the English translation as it's, it's stated here, that's not the law that if you marry someone else that you've committed adultery as the man. So if he actually said that, he would be teaching contrary to the law. He can't come along and teach contrary to the law and be sinless and be the Messiah. Do you understand it, how important this is? We have the law to look at. And what he's saying here is contrary to the law. And so it's just one more thing in what so far we've come to see as a bit of a nightmare that the book of Luke actually is. And with that, I'm going to wrap it. There's no way I'm going to even touch the rich man and Lazarus today. So that's it for episode nine. I hope you all have a good day.